Welcome to Listen Here, the audiobook podcast where we bring you chapter listens of our much loved audiobooks and sometimes special guest appearances. Combining a mindful approach to exercise with delicious, nutritious recipes, global superstar Ellie Golding will help you kickstart healthy habits, develop a positive mindset, and establish clear, achievable goals. Ellie Golding has amassed multiple UK number one singles, Brit Awards, and Grammy nominations over the span of her career. Now, after years of inspiring fans with her love of fitness and wellness, in Fitter, Calmer, Stronger, she shares her favorite recipes, workouts, and training principles. Forget prescriptive 28-day plans and fad diets that are sooner or later abandoned. They don't work and they don't make you happy. Ellie's much sought after fitness and health philosophy is based on becoming the brightest, strongest version of yourself. In this book, The Pop Powerhouse provides advice and regimens to improve your health and fitness, such as a holistic approach to feeling and being your best, learning to listen to your body, and establishing permanent rituals that work for you. Going far beyond just diet and exercise, fitter, calmer, stronger, encompasses all that improves your relationship with your physical and mental health. Drawing on Ellie's experiences, as well as the advice of friends and experts like Aunt Middleton, Fern Cotton, and Katie Taylor, you can use these tools and techniques every day to build a fitter, calmer, stronger you. Workouts and recipes are included in the audiobook companion PDF download. Now, here's an exclusive sneak peek of Fitter, Calmer, Stronger by Ellie Golding. Chapter One. Be your brightest self. The oak fights the wind and breaks. The willow bends and lives on. Robert Jordan, author. Brightest Self, a transformation where you aim to be emotionally and physically prepared for the rigours of life. To be empowered, knowing you have the mental agility and strength in your body to be resilient. You can be peaceful when you need peace and have the energy to take off like a rocket when you need to act. So many people I know think that fitness and health is about control and rules. No judgment. I mean, I was absolutely convinced it was about those things for a long time. And perhaps staying healthy shouldn't be that complicated. But it becomes loaded, not least with other people's expectations. This has a sort of domino effect. Pressure pushes on fear, and fear pushes on perfection. And I know we're all familiar with the latter. Honestly, it's like the perfection Olympics out there. It is madness. Women in particular have been conditioned to act as if they're competing for the gold medal. But in reality, you just run around in a massive circle, trying to attain an unattainable standard. Have no fear of perfection, you'll never reach it, said the artist Salvador Dali. I think you'll agree he was definitely onto something. But in practice, if you're not a Catalan surrealist painter, it can be difficult to disentangle yourself. Perfectionism often plays out by us seeking control. I've done this for most of my life, and you've likely done a lot of it too. For me, there's a massive misconception when it comes to health and fitness that the more control you assert in order to attain perfection, the more you'll achieve. It kind of makes sense, but it is a trap. Now you know I didn't come to this realisation overnight. Neither have I ditched all of my bad habits. I'm definitely a work in progress, but there has been so much progress. As I've actively committed to being in charge of my health and improving my diet, my sleep, and my training regimen. This is a big change. My low days used to be ridiculously low. I just couldn't find a way out of them, and it would set me right back. I often felt as if I were failing, because when I felt down, I wasn't being productive. Then I'd be preoccupied with silly, irrational thoughts about my life or rehashing some slight argument I'd had with someone six years beforehand. Finally, I'd forget to move. Later in the book, 
I'll talk about how movement is such a restorative, brilliant thing to do. But honestly, I used to forget it was an option. I could quickly set myself up for the shittiest of days. If you recognise any of this, take a moment to think about how and why you can get caught up in some of these traps. Our personal histories are deeply relevant here. I work in an industry that has long been associated with recklessness, booze and substances, interrupted sleep and constant ups and downs, especially on tour. In short, being a pop star is not associated with balance, sobriety and a big interest in nutrition and total body conditioning. Add on to that the fact that I am from what the media calls a normal background, by which they mean low-cost housing in Hereford, a rural part of the United Kingdom that borders England and Wales. From my perspective, I definitely didn't have the most challenging childhood, by which I mean people have had a lot worse. It's just that there were lots of factors in mine, which on their own might have been okay, but altogether felt like a lot. My parents got divorced when I was very young, so my dad wasn't a part of my life growing up, and my mum really struggled with money, while having to raise four kids in a small house. I had a sort of stepfather, whom I clashed with massively. There was a lot of tension in our house, a lot of stress, and a lot of anxiety whirling around among all of us. All of this means that there was a certain expectation about me, as I think there are with many women in the industry who burst onto the music scene and become successful beyond our wildest dreams. I'm using these phrases because this is the way our story is often written. By the way, my wild dreams have nothing to do with success. Of course, there have been some crazy moments, and at times, I did feel I'd been in the fast spin cycle of a washing machine. But that can be true of any industry. You may well have experienced periods that felt a bit chaotic, where you lost sense of yourself and your well-being went out the window. It's easily done. But what I've always felt is that there is a sense from spectators that they were waiting for the fall. There was a strong sense that my life was bound to go horribly wrong. I think they wanted me to end up as a crumpled little heap, my feet sticking out from under my guitar. In fact, it often felt as if male music journalists thought I had no business even playing a guitar. I think it's to do with being a woman, plucked from obscurity, another very odd phrase. The upshot is that you're often made to feel that you are where you are because you've been granted temporary access. That's quite destabilizing, and it can make you feel you have to prove yourself over and over again. Later in this book, I'll tell you more about the pressures that were on me when I started out in the music business and how that affected my health and self-perception. The two are so linked, I think. But even though it wasn't clear sailing, I am proud that I was always able to maintain my training and some of my fitness. In many ways, the practice of emotional survival during my childhood had already instilled in me a strong sense of what was dangerous. So I knew that I couldn't go down a route of excess and extreme, and that exercise or movement, even a quick jog in the middle of a hectic tour, would be the thing that kept me together. But I was still far away from being my brightest self. I was using my fitness to keep on the straight and narrow, or to build stamina, so that I could work even harder. I wasn't using it for me, and I had not yet been able to work out how to balance my creative process with my rational side. As I mentioned in the introduction to this book, good songwriting comes from a difficult place, submitting to pain and reliving trauma, not doing squats in the gym or creating smoothie recipes. I'll get on the subject of friends later, but for now, I just want to say that I love those people who just cut to the chase and are super honest about you. One day, I was working with my friend Nathan, who is my stylist. Our working relationship was fairly new, and Nathan seemed somewhat puzzled by the direction of some of my recent looks, which were very much about being incredibly glossy and involved extravagant hair extensions and that kind of thing. Can I ask, he said gently, in a way that I've begun to realise is very Nathan-esque. 
What is your motivation for your look? Hmm, I thought. Now that is an interesting question. And just like that, it dawned on me that I was trying to look how I thought the perfect pop princess should look. I realise this is quite a niche story, but I guarantee you'll have your version of it. We can all get stuck trying to recreate the perfect archetype. Wife, mother, singer, performer, surgeon, athlete, you name it. But it pays to be alert to this, because if you're trying to reach perfection as an archetype, then as Salvador Dali might have also put it, you're going to fuck it up. I also think there's a strong link between perfection and fear. That has certainly been my experience. As I was thinking about how to explain this, I began reading Untamed, a memoir by the activist, speaker, and wonderful writer Glennon Doyle, who majors in the joy and peace we can achieve when we stop trying to meet the expectations of the world around us and start trusting the voice within us. I would highly recommend her books. This sentence from Untamed beamed out at me, as if it were backlit. What the world needs is more women who have quit fearing themselves and started trusting themselves. Yas, Glennon, this is exactly it. You simply cannot realise your brightest self if you are dancing to someone else's tune. Same if you are trying to run someone else's race or emulate an influencer's idea of fitness as prescribed by social media. Similarly, fear leads us to associate successful health and fitness with control and deprivation expressions of fear. What I want us to try doing is to flip that on its head, listen to the voice deep within us, and trust ourselves rather than a lot of external rules and signals created by other people. That voice, that trust, and that confidence add up to your brightest self. But we're not going to flick a switch and turn the old you off and the brightest self on. Sorry. It doesn't work like that. This is all a work in progress, a spring cleaning to retire old patterns of behaviour and mindsets in favour of moving forward and, as we go through the chapters, combining physical training with nutrition and the building of emotional resilience. But first, I want to set out my 10 principles. These are the foundations all of our work will be built on. One. Swap out perfection for flexibility. I have to admit, I felt quite stupid when I realised the perfection I had dedicated myself to achieving didn't really exist. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? But I also felt a tremendous sense of relief. No more, oh, I have to be the best singer, the best athlete, the best friend, and the best girlfriend of all time, blah, blah, blah. That realisation came just at the right time, because I'm also now a wife and a mum, and I certainly wouldn't have wanted to subject those roles to my perfection quest. Actually, I don't think you should ever lower your horizons. I strongly believe you should try hard and strive to be the best version of yourself in all areas of your life, from career to exercise, because it will make you feel good. But swapping out the complete fiction of perfection Hell yeah. Instead, you are replacing this with the understanding that you need a flexible, agile approach to life. This is because the flip side of perfection isn't being a chaotic hot mess. Sometimes we feel this is where we'll end up if we relinquish control. It is flexibility. To put that in the context of our work in this book, what you do most of the time is more important than what you do some of the time. Matt Roberts, Pixie Turner and I are not going to hunt you down and read you the riot act if you order a takeout once a week to share with somebody you love. Because that doesn't take away from eating healthy, nourishing meals all the rest of the week. Similarly, skipping a gym session because you've had a bad day at work and didn't sleep well last night doesn't take away from all the other hard work you've put in and the sessions you usually do. Letting go of perfection is about giving yourself a break. People who strive for perfection, and I've been there as we've seen, end up either burned out or feeling like they're constantly failing. They do not feel like their brightest selves. 
2. What you wear doesn't matter. Closely related to the abandonment of perfection, this second point mixes a bit of flexibility with courage. Social media has a lot to answer for, especially in the health and fitness space. It can make us feel constrained by a standardised idea of what looks good. This extends from being preoccupied with facial expressions. Honestly, I've heard heartbreaking stories of young women refusing to lift heavy weights in case they make funny faces, to obsessing about wearing matching workout sets or limiting workouts to Instagrammable routines with Pex McGee trainers who shout motivational phrases while you pretend to be absolutely fine. Let's just trash all of that, shall we? The truth is, a good workout is ugly and often boring to watch. It's sweaty and, with my skin tones, quite often tomato-faced. Some people are beautiful runners. I am not one of them. Somehow, I always look like this is my first run. This is probably not enhanced by my greying, fraying gym shorts that have clocked up eight years of service and hundreds of wears. But they're just so damned comfortable. So never let social media, or anything else, lead you to believe you're somehow lacking or less than. Resilience. The art of caring for the right things. Maxime Legace, writer. 3. Engage your other, mental, core. I wish you understood how resilient you are already. We so often just scrape the surface when it comes to our mental toughness. I know the phrase, dig deep, is a super annoying fitness cliche. But honestly, it shouldn't just be something you do when you plant trees. There's a moment in every fitness session when we can keep going or we can stop. If you keep going, you will not regret it. When I talk about strength, I am referring to both my physical and my emotional strength, because we need both of these to help us through tough situations. I know from my husband, Casper, that rowers refer to this point as seeing the red mist. It's where the urge to get to the finish overpowers what you've got left physically. It becomes exclusively about the mind. Casper describes it like breaking through a barrier where pain is the only thing you feel, but because you know you are so close to the finish, you can somehow take it. I'm not suggesting we have to go this far and go through life seeking out red mist scenarios, but I'm completely fascinated by the remarkable human mind and the fact that this strength lies dormant in us all. In the introduction to this book, I mentioned that Casper and I use training in really different ways. But here, I've definitely learned from him. Whereas I used to say to myself, I'm going to avoid that situation because it will make me feel unhappy or take me out of my comfort zone. Now, I will often say to myself, there will always be tough moments, so I need to strengthen my mind to navigate calmly through them. When you achieve that level of composure in a difficult situation, then it feels like you are really moving forward. This is summed up perfectly by one of my favourite quotes from the poet and activist Jung Pueblo. I knew I was on the right path when I started feeling peace in situations I would normally feel tension. But while inner strength and resilience is important, acknowledging our weaknesses and vulnerability is also fundamental. So I also think it's important to acknowledge that it's completely okay to feel uncomfortable in situations when society or peers seem to think you should breeze through. I've had to be around big crowds most of my adult life, and yet sometimes I get so nervous I'm seriously afraid I'm going to throw up. A really good way to handle these moments is to tell someone in the same position, and nine times out of ten, they will confess to feeling exactly the same. There's nothing like an ally when you're scared out of your wits. Following a tricky situation where you felt very uncomfortable, take time to reflect without tearing yourself apart about it. What is of use is understanding why you felt so nervous in that room of people or why you might have started an argument. Throughout this book, we'll use those types of reflections because they are of great value in navigating your future.
4. Be as kind to yourself as you are to your best friend. In the past, the way I sometimes spoke to myself was frankly unacceptable. So I asked myself, why would I let myself get away with negative self-talk? If I had a friend who did that, I would give them their friendship pink slip. By the way, my real friends are absolutely legends, and I'll talk about the importance of having them in my life in a little more detail later on. But there's a huge difference between being intensely hard on ourselves and gently making fun of ourselves. The latter has been a lifesaver for me. I'm forever finding parallels with me in pop star scenarios and scenes from extras or Alan Partridge. I have laughed at myself, often by myself, in pretty much every country on earth, often on live TV. And I'm glad I did, because without that stress release, I would have most likely fallen apart. But overall, try and be as kind to yourself as you are to your best friend. Acknowledge your achievements, no matter how small. And remember, it's all about progression, not perfection. Try this exercise. Ask yourself, what do I like about myself? What am I good at? How would my best friends describe me? It's okay. You can do this in the privacy of your own room rather than out loud on the bus. I saw a therapist recently who did this exercise with me. She asked me questions like, would you say you were kind? And would your friends describe you as kind? Initially, I did that typical British thing of feeling embarrassed and trying to make a joke about being a terrible person. But then I surprised myself by really thinking about the therapist's questions and answering them honestly. I was taken aback by what a difference it made to how I was feeling. I thought, I really do care about my friends, and I really do think I'm good at these things. I would almost describe it as revelatory. By the way, if it's very British to love self-deprecating comedy like Alan Partridge, then it is decidedly un-British to talk about accessing professional psychotherapy. I consider myself really lucky to have the means to access a professional therapist periodically. In fact, I think it is one of the best investments I've made in my well-being. If you feel this route is for you, be sure to find a therapist who is accredited. 5. Remember, you are the gatekeeper. I want you to imagine a roped-off VIP area in an old-fashioned club. Over lockdown, I have genuinely caught myself longing to be in a smelly, sticky club. The rope is one of those thick red ones, and there's a bouncer on a power trip who decides who is let into this area by looking them up and down and unhooking the rope to let them in. The burly bouncer, that's you. But this space is both your mind and your diary. Who you let in defines how you're going to spend your day. If you fill this space, with horrible, brawling, or boring people, you're going to have a shit day. So choose wisely. As you're the gatekeeper for your mind, you can choose what you let in. Just as food is there to nourish the body, this is the stuff that fuels your mind. Whether it's social media, sugar, excessive working, too much exercise, you are under no obligation to let this stuff in. Indeed, Ultimately, as you know these are bad for you, it's completely logical that you would choose to limit them. While I'm not averse to the odd evening watching the Real Housewives format from any number of geographical locations, I do believe we also need access to high-quality, intelligent opinion and trusted, impartial news organisations. I like to hear from educators and people who empower me and help me prioritise the things that are super important to me. That's the reason I don't fill up my days watching online clips of angry people full of hate. And it's the reason I am trying to limit scrolling on social media. My inner bouncer says, not on the list, love. There are times when your only available tools are your mind and your breath. Catherine Carrigan, medical intuitive healer and author. Six, get serious about breathing. A surprising amount of my songs feature lyrics about breathing. 
the same is true of other artists' songs too. I think I might be a bit obsessed. But then, I wonder why more of us aren't into breathing, beyond just staying alive. Inhaling deeply and taking that breath right down to oxygenate the whole body is a secret superpower that can boost your training capacity. Yet again, breathing well is an example of something we turn to in times of crisis. Demonstrations by doctors of breathing techniques went viral in the early days of COVID-19, but rarely talk about in everyday life. I think this is an oversight. Every time someone mentions breathing, I find myself taking a really deep breath, not just an instinctive shallow breath where we only half fill our upper chest, but a full breath that feels like it has passed through every cell in the body. It seems way too easy, but it really is the most simple but effective way of bringing ourselves back into the moment, when we're caught moping in the past or future. When I had my first panic attack, which I'll talk more about in the next chapter, I took myself to the hospital, convinced I was having a heart attack and expecting to be hooked up to machines. Instead, I was simply given a paper bag and told to breathe, breathe. Whenever I feel stressed, I think about this moment. It's such a clear reminder of the power of our breath and how learning to control it can help our nervous system and calm our senses. In Chapter 6, Find Your Strength, Bar Supremo Katie Miller is going to talk you through a really powerful breathing exercise. I'd love you to remember that breathing can be used for much more than just filling our lungs to survive. Our breath is intrinsically linked to our physical and mental well-being, and learning how to breathe properly can transform your health. Never forget that you have it at your disposal whenever you might need it. 7. Food is your fuel. We'll talk about food a lot in this book. We'll look at our relationship with it, my relationship with it, and how this often needs fixing, especially in Chapter 4, Nourish Your Body. But I want to make some key points now as these are central to the way I think about health and fitness overall. Food gives us energy, sustenance, and the strength to move our bodies and get through the day. We need to eat, and we need to eat well. I don't think deprivation is ever the answer, especially when it comes to food. Food is there to make us better and stronger, happier and healthier. It nourishes your body, and it fuels your muscles, but that only works if you eat the right things. I believe it's so important to understand what we're putting into our bodies and the effect this has on our physical and mental well-being. As much pleasure as a chocolate bar or takeout brings, and I've felt that times 1,000 during pregnancy, it doesn't last as long as the feeling you get when you eat healthy, nourishing food. Be mindful of foods that offer fast but temporary gratification and educate yourself on the benefits of a good diet. The more you learn about the powerful nutritional and emotional benefits of food, the more you'll want to eat well and enjoy the process of preparing food too. Food is also a complete joy. It binds us to people and can bring comfort in a very healthy way. I'm imagining a Sunday roast, for example. It's delicious, but also heartwarming and good for the soul. It's also the one time, other than Christmas Day, when I actually like to be uncomfortably full. A dinner party with wine similarly offers a moment of escape with friends. How much did we miss that during the long lockdowns of the global pandemic? In almost every culture, food forms a central part of celebration. That means, for billions of humans, food is at the heart of their most cherished memories on Earth. But healthy food can also be joyful. And I think that fact is often ignored. The other day, I made an acai bowl for breakfast, and it brought me an embarrassing amount of pleasure. 
I had to text at least five people to let them know. Sorry, guys. I had it with goji berries, which are sweet and madly good for you. Hemp protein, cacao nibs, which give you a burst of energy, blueberries, raspberries, and chia seeds. I threw it all in a bowl. It was so simple to make. And not only did it taste like heaven, but it overachieved on five-a-day health advice and then some. Yep, I get competitive about my fruit and veg goals. And yet, I often have to keep this nutritional superiority quiet to avoid offending those who subsist on sugar and make rabbit food comments when I mention vegan ingredients. I also resent it when people almost shame others for taking pride in their love for healthy food. If you're having junk food, good for you. But don't mock someone for legitimately enjoying something that is a bit healthier. Well, the good news is, there's no keeping quiet in this book. All the recipes included in the accompanying PDF are super healthy and nutritious. But, and this bit was really important for me when I was writing this book, also delicious and joyful and great to share with friends and people you love. 8. Ditch the comparisons Were I ever to hold significant office with lawmaking capability? Unlikely, I know. First off, I'd ban perfectionism. And next, I'd ban comparisons. Every journey is individual, so never compare yours to someone else's. It is simply not useful. Nor, when we come to health and fitness, is it credible. We've all been brought up differently, with our own childhood and influences along the way. We all have different genetic makeups. We store fat differently. We have different hormone levels, different body shapes, different likes and dislikes, different fitness levels, different pain thresholds, and different motivations. That is why life is unique for all of us. So, for example, Mindlessly eating the same food as someone else you admire the look of really doesn't work. You need to listen to and understand your own body, a subject we'll move on to soon. At this point, I'm going to return to the subject of social media. I find a lot of people's comparison obsession takes place on Instagram these days, and there are reasons to be really careful of this. Social media platforms such as Instagram, can distort our reality. According to psychology researchers, such as Danielle Wagstaff from the Federation University in Australia, I came across a fascinating article where Danielle describes the way in which our brain compares the images of influences that we follow to create a schema, a cognitive representation of your sense of self and of other people. Back in the day, your social circle was formed of friends and family, she explained in the piece. Now you have access to all of these influences. That means our perceived social circle is enormous. It would be too exhausting to make a judgment every time you saw a new image of someone from this circle. So cognitively, your mind automatically creates an average. But the problem with this average, according to Danielle, is that all the images you're exposed to on social media are highly curated and edited. Even no filter, no makeup shots are selected, meaning that the average that your brain creates is not a true representation of someone's lifestyle, attractiveness, or income. If you're constantly being presented with false information or information that is biased, then your schema is biased. It doesn't represent the real world, she concludes. 9. The destination is not the point. I used to fixate on making songs that would chart high, hustling designers to secure the best outfits I could, and always trying to be on top, because anything less wasn't good enough. But then came the dawning realisation that this strategy completely missed the point. In fact, it meant I was bypassing the thing that gave me joy in the first place. The creativity, the process, and the very thing my craft is based on. Noticing what is going on around me, 
listening to people, and taking things in, I was able to recalibrate and reprioritize my creativity. The more I focused on enjoying every moment, even the boring moments, the more the good stuff started to come naturally. This is my way of emphasizing that rather than obsessing about an end goal, you need to make the journey, this journey, part of your process and enjoy it as part of your achievement. It's great to run a 5K or a 10K or maybe lose the weight you weren't happy about. But I would advise that you don't worry too much about achieving an end goal. In fact, my hope is that we forget big health goals and start thinking about good health as a sustainable, long-term way of living. I really believe there is so much satisfaction and peace of mind when you know you made extra effort to become a stronger version of yourself. 10. Hold yourself accountable. This might sound a bit tough and a bit like something a teacher might have said to you at school, but it is truly liberating to acknowledge that you are accountable for your own health and well-being. At the risk of sounding a bit weird, I almost think of it like I've signed a contract with myself. I'm not talking about making it a big deal, like the Magna Carta, with trumpets and a formal declaration at Runnymede. But even a tacit acknowledgement to yourself that you are on the case here will work. What are you committing to? Well, just to knowing that there is no magical force at work here. This is not luck, but consistent commitment and hard work will really help you to turn all of this self-knowledge and hard work into consistent progress. And the truth is that from time to time, you'll lose your mojo and motivation. We all do. You'll eat a donut instead of going for a run. Good. A, thank you for keeping me company in the being very human stakes. And B, you may well have needed it. But because you're in a serious relationship with your fitness, and you've made this contract, you will always have that link back. You will correct your course, pick up your routine, and recommit. Because that's what you do. I really find this helpful. Because for me, it's about approaching everything in a connected, sustainable, and balanced way. These are ways of being and living that you will stick with for the long term, and it should feel great to know and understand that. Do you love books? Of course you do. That's why you're here. So we want to let you in on our secret book club BFF, Page Chaser. Page Chaser is an online community for book lovers. From fiction, self-care, spirituality, and more, they're here to bring you what's bingeable and quizzable. Page Chaser's community is constantly working to fill your TBR list. Follow their blog, sign up for their newsletter, or check out their Instagram lives, stories, and reels for sneak peeks and join in on the fun. Everything from new releases, deals, and monthly giveaways, there's something for every book lover at Page Chaser. Connect with Page Chaser on Facebook, follow them on Instagram at page.chaser, or sign up for their newsletter at pagechaser.com and let them know what you love reading. Now tell us, do you dog ear? Thank you for spending time with us, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen Here. Check back next week for more audiobook samples and maybe a special guest or two. Follow us wherever you listen to podcasts or find us on Instagram and TikTok at Listen Here Podcast. And visit our website, listenherepodcast.com for more information or to find the books we've talked about.